Good morning, everyone. This is Rick Leipzig, the director of the NIEHS. And I want to welcome all of you to the September 2022 National Advisory Environmental Health Sciences Council uh, meeting. So I think, David, I, the next step here is to for me to write the Sunshine Act. That's so correct. I will do that. So for, oh, wait, I have the virtual gavel. Bang, bang, bang. It's just been done. So we open the meeting. So pursuant to the government in the Sunshine Act, all aspects of this meeting are open to the public except for the review, discussion, and evaluation of grant applications and related information, which is uh, something we just finished in the closed session. So, okay, so welcome everyone. And David, I think I turn it back over to you. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so we're gonna start uh, with uh, introductions uh, of uh, the members of council and, and some of our uh, staff that are in the Zoom. Uh, and so we'll start with the full members of, of council. And as we did in the closed session, uh, we will run through this list in alphabetical order. And so I will call on you. Uh, as we go through. So the first is Phil Bourne. Good morning, everyone, uh, at least on the East Coast. Uh, I'm Phil Bourne. I'm the Dean of Data Science at the University of Virginia. Thank you, Phil. Next is Lynn Goldman. Hello, uh, I'm Lynn Goldman, Dean of the School of Public Health at George Washington University. Thank you, Lynn. Next is Irva Hertzpikioto. Uh, Irva, you're muted. Uh, Irva hertz Pichotto. I'm the director of the uh, NIEHS UC Davis, University of California Davis Environmental Health Sciences Center. Welcome, everybody. Uh, next is Andre Holian. Andre Holian, uh, University of Montana, director of Center for Environmental Health Sciences. And good morning, everyone. Morning, Andre. I believe that Jenny Ingram is not with us today, but just want to make sure. Excellent. Uh, Terry Kavanaugh. Morning, everyone. Uh, Terry Kavanaugh, professor at the University of Washington, uh, Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences and associate director of our P30 uh, course center. And Gary Miller. Hi, Gary Miller, I'm Vice Dean of Research at the School of Public Health at Columbia University and a professor of environmental health sciences. And Trevor Penning. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Trevor Penning. I am the director of the P30 Environmental Health Sciences Core Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And Marla Perez Lugo. Hello, everyone. Uh, Marla Perez Lugo, Professor of Sociology and Disaster Studies at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And last but definitely not least, Karen Vasquez. Hello, everyone. Karen Vasquez. I am Professor and Division Head of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so our, our next group of council members are members who have been on an approved slate but have not completely finished the vetting process. So they are participating today in an ad hoc uh, ex officio fashion, uh, starting with Tim Greenemeyer. Hi, I'm, I'm Tim Greenemeyer. I'm a professor of neurology and director of the Pittsburgh Institute for Neurodegenerative Diseases at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Welcome to council, Tim. And Daryl Hood. You're muted, Daryl. Hi, Daryl Hood, professor um, in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences uh, in the College of Public Health at The Ohio State University. Let me counsel Daryl. And Carrie Hornbuckle. Good morning. I'm Carrie Hornbuckle. I'm a professor in civil environmental engineering at the University of Iowa and director of the Iowa Superfund Research Program. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome to council. Thank you. Andrew Jorgensen. Good morning. I am professor and chair of the sociology department and professor of environmental studies at Boston College. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to council. And Gokun Mutlu. Hi, good morning. I'm a Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Section of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Chicago. Great. Thank you, Gokin, and welcome to Council. So our next uh, 
our final group of, of council members are our uh, ex officio members representing other federal agencies providing advice to the NIEHS. Again, ex officio members uh, are participate in the discussion but do not uh, cast votes on actions. Uh, first is our CDC representative, Bill Sabulis, who I believe is not with us today. Bill, are you on? And Andrew Geller. Hi, I'm Andrew Geller. Uh, Senior Science Advisor to Office of Research and Development at the Environmental Protection Agency. Good morning, everyone. Andrew and Susie Fitzpatrick. Uh, Susie Fitzpatrick, Senior Advisor for Toxicology at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and then we'll um, introduce the members of the senior leadership at NIEHS, uh, starting with Rick. Let me unmute. So, so Rick Wycheck, the director of NIHS and the director of the National Toxicology Program. And Trevor Archer. Good morning. I'm uh, Trevor Archer, an NIH distinguished investigator and deputy director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And Brian Barridge. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Barridge. I'm the scientific director for the newly renamed Division of Translational Toxicology, formerly known as the Division of the National Toxicology Program. And Daryl Zeldin, are you on, Daryl? Okay. And Jan Hall, are you on? I am. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a uh, senior investigator at NIEHS and the clinical director. Uh, Gwen, are you on? I didn't see Gwen on the participant list. Uh, Jay Mathis, are, I think this is your first council meeting, Jay. So, so. It Enjoy is. Time. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Jay Ingrid Mathis. I go by Jay, and I am the executive officer and the associate director for management. Welcome to Council, Jay. Uh, and Michelle Bennett. Michelle was on. Yep, sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Michelle Bennett. Um, I serve as the senior advisor for strategic initiatives here at the NIEHS. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Michelle. And I, of course, am David Balshaw. I am the acting director of the Division of Extramural Research and Training. Uh, so this is this is my first council. So please uh, forgive any rough edges as we run through this. But I think uh, you know, thanks to Liz and and Pat's support, I think we'll run a pretty uh, tight ship today. So I want to get us started uh, with some some housekeeping items. Just reminders. Um, we will not be taking a, a full lunch break today. We're going to take a 15 uh, minute break this afternoon. And also tomorrow we'll be taking a very brief break um, to allow people to grab your lunch and come back and we'll, we'll continue working through. Um, as you have noted, this is a, a strictly virtual meeting. Um, so we are operating in a, a webcast. Uh, most of the, the public participants are uh, on a webcast and do not have the option of unmuting or, or um, uh, asking questions that way, but there is an email address that you can submit questions. And I believe that you can use uh, the, the Q&A pod to, to ask questions uh, as the public members. Uh, for those of us who are on the, the, the Zoom side, um, please remember uh, to keep your uh, microphone muted whenever you're not actively speaking uh, and remain on mute until recognized to speak. So please use the raise hand feature and the reactions uh, and I will, will be uh, moderating discussions uh, using that. Um, and again, once you're completed speaking, please uh, re return to mute. Uh, if you're not actively speaking, uh, we ask that you please keep your video off to preserve a little bit of uh, bandwidth uh, and also to keep your video off and muted during the break. Uh, again, members of the public who wish to express views on any items discussed in the meeting can do so uh, by sending an email to council using the email address listed on the council webpage, which is national.advisory.council at nihs.nih.gov. Um, we will be uh, voting on a couple actions this afternoon, and that voting will be conducted in the Electronic Council Book for Council members, again, with a, a, a motion and a vote to approve, disapprove, or abstain. Um, any questions on the, the kind of flow of, of Zoom? Daryl, I mean, uh, David, 
Dr. Zeldin is on if you want to let him know. Uh, Daryl, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Daryl Zeldin, Scientific Director of DIR. Thank you, Daryl. So we'll uh, move to the next action item, uh, which is uh, uh, voting uh, for the, the consideration of the June 2022 uh, meeting minutes. These minutes have been made available to the, the council members and on the NIEHS uh, council webpage. Um, council members were asked to review these before the meeting. Uh, they are also included in the electronic council book for your immediate review. Uh, and I am to uh, ask for a motion to uh, approve the minutes from a council member. So, so moved. moved. Thank you, Terry. And second by Phil, I believe. Any comments, discussion on the, the minutes? Okay, please record your vote. The quorum has been met. Thank you, Liz. Uh, reminder on upcoming meeting dates. Um, the, the future meetings of the council, again, these are public meetings, have been posted on the NIEHS webpage, are also available in your electronic council book uh, and the general information tab. Our next meeting will be February 21st and 22nd of 2023. Hopefully we'll be able to do that as a hybrid meeting, uh, depending upon the, the situation with, with COVID. So look forward to actually seeing people in person again. Uh, with that, and three minutes ahead of schedule, uh, we'll turn it over to, to Rick for the report from the director of NIEHS. Right, thanks very much, David. And as David just said, let's hope that in February, 2023, we will all be together, at least some of us together in uh, our remodeled Rodville Auditorium, and then we can enjoy each other's presence and we can have a meeting with at least some of us in the room together. So there's a lot to cover today, so I'm going to get right into this. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about the budget and I'll talk about some of the leadership updates. Actually, Brian referred to the the fact that we've renamed the, the division of the National Toxicology Program, I'll give you a little bit of background and why we did that. Um, talk about some recent events that relate to actually a very exciting uh, course center meeting that happened in New York uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, talk about a little bit about PFAS. Uh, PFAS will be on the agenda uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, we'll also talk about uh, where we're going with, with respect to strategic planning. And then I'm going to spend the, the bulk of the time today uh, engaging in some strategy thinking and uh, to reminding you of some of the areas of scientific focus that the Senior Leadership Committee has been engaged in since I become director in 20, uh, June of 2020. Uh, 2020. And uh, then I hope that we can you know, have a very engaging discussion. I'd like to get your feedback uh, so we can be thinking strategically about where do we want to be taking things in the environmental sciences community. So let's go to the next slide, please. So on budget, you look all the way on the left, the FY22 enacted, you know, it was remarkable. It took Congress almost six months to pass a budget for the current fiscal year. And in the end, it was actually pretty good news for the NIH. Uh, so like most of the other ICs, uh, we received about a 3.4% increase in our primary allocation. Uh, and the Superfund did get an increase as well, but it was only 1.23%. So we're gonna continue to work to see if we can fix that. Um, you know, the Superfund, as many of you know, does a lot of very important work and sure would be nice to see some more robust increases happening in the budget for the Superfund program. So our DOE allocation stayed the same at about $10 million. So when you add it all up, it puts us just sh short of a billion dollars at about 935 million. So we were hoping for a, and I think I talked about this in June, uh, we were hoping for a $100 million increase in our base specifically to support climate change and health research. It was in the president's budget, uh, it was in the Senate and it was in the house, uh, but in the end it didn't come through and it didn't come through for a variety of reasons. Uh, part of which could have been that we have this new war that's happening in Europe and Ukraine. So we'll see what we can do. So as we look forward uh, to FY23, so the fiscal year, as I think most of you know, it starts on October 1st. So we're about uh, less than a month away. 
Uh, although realistically, uh, based on past experience, uh, we expect that there will be a continuing resolution through the end of the calendar year. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that after the elections in November, that Congress will kind of get their act together and have a budget to us by the end of December, which would be great. Now, if you look at the, the histograms here, the good news is that the president's budget for FY23 looks pretty favorable for NIHS. It has a sizable increase uh, for our base budget, which would include approximately $100 million for climate change and health. Now, the House uh, budget, the House Labor HHS bill, has NIEHS in a market of about $878.8 million, which is an increase of $36.6 million from FY22. Now, the report language specifically indicates that $10 million of that increase would be dedicated to climate change and health research. And this would leave about 3% uh, three increase for you know, the base allocation funding for non-climate change and health research at NIEHS. So if you look all the way over, one more over. So the FY23 Senate Labor HHS bill provides 918.3 million, which is a 76.1 million increase above FY22. So this would include an additional $50 million specifically for the dedicated for the purpose of climate change and health. And again, this would leave NIHS with an increase of about 3% uh, uh, for our base funding for non-climate change and health research. So the Superfund program actually will get uh, slated to get a modest increase again of about $500,000. And we're hoping that the DOE $10 million allocation will come through once again. So in the end, using the president's numbers, this would bring us to just over a billion at about $1 billion, $25 million. So we're not the biggest IC, we're not the smallest IC, but you know, I think this is a, a nice chunk of change and we're gonna work with all of you and, and do our best to make sure that we can get the maximum bang for our buck with this funding. So let's see, let's go on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership updates, both centrally as well as things that are happening here at NIHS. Next slide. So the last time any of you asked about ARPA-H, and I told you about the program, and today I can tell you, because it was just announced yesterday, that the new inaugural director of ARPA-H will be Dr. Rene Wixer, Wickerson. Wickerson. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. She has a doctorate applied in applied biology from Georgia Tech. She completed her postdoctoral training as an Alexander von Humboldt fellow in, at, uh, in Heidelberg. And she is currently the vice president for business development at Gingo Bioworks. And she is the head of innovation at Concentric by Gingo. So she is focused on applying synthetic biology to outpace uh, infectious diseases really a very important area of science. And previously she was a program manager at DARPA. So she, it's clear she knows her way around the type of managerial infrastructure that will be necessary to support the ARPA-H program, uh, which as I explained last time is, is very different than the administrative infrastructure that we, the rest of us use to manage programs across the NIH. Uh, so rest assured, I know this is an area of great interest to many of you. So as I learn more, I will keep you all informed. So welcome to Renee. It's great to have her with us. So next slide, please. Okay, and as Brian indicated, uh, we have a name change for the division, well, previously the division of the National Toxicology Program, but as of September 1st, 2022, the name of this division, has been changed to the NIEHS Division of Translational Toxicology or DTT. So this name change, it really culminates in you know, several months. You know, under Dr. Barrage's leadership, there were deliberations amongst the division leadership and much discussion with the staff about their future identity and their brand, you know, quote unquote, their brand uh, within the organization. Uh, and the DTT has really defined its mission to improve public health through data and knowledge development that are translatable, predictive, and timely. 
which is complementary and it's different than the work that happens, for example, within our division of intramural research. So therefore the division of translational toxicology is the DTT is a name that more clearly describes the division's work and makes it clear that they're taking on research to address contemporary public health issues. So the DTT will be involved in developing new approaches that increase our ability to predict human hazards. Uh, and a big focus of the work of the division will be on producing data, capabilities, methods, and products that are more efficient, cost-effective, human health relevant, and are less dependent on animal studies. So as in the past, and I wanna emphasize this because I know that there was some misunderstanding about that, uh, much of the DTT's work will continue to support the multi-agency US National Toxicology Program. So we're no longer the division of the National Toxicology Program, but the DTT is one of the principal organizations together with NCTR at the FDA, NIOSH at CDC, working collaboratively together uh, as part of the National Toxicology Program. So the NTP was never meant to be a division of the NIEHS. It's always a collaborative opportunity with other federal agencies within HHS. So, so we got a name change, which I think more accurately reflects the work that's actually happening. And, uh, and it, it actually follows from the very exciting and bold vision that uh, Dr. Barrage brought to the division when he started with us uh, about five years ago. But next slide. But now that we have this powerful new vision that will help to ensure the future of the DTT, and we have the name change to support that uh, vision, it's uh, actually with mixed emotions that Dr. Barrage let me know that he wishes to leave the federal government at the end of January, 2023. So that's coming up in just a few months. So that will this uh, January, 2023 will be his fifth anniversary since joining NIEHS. And I say mixed emotions because well, I hate to see Brian leave the division, especially at the point where we seem to be now blossoming in very powerful ways with this powerful vision and new name change, really positioning ourselves to do exciting new translational things. Uh, Brian and I've talked about this. Look, I think the, his true passion is in getting his hands dirty with the actual science and especially in the area of cardiovascular disease. And my sense is that everyone should have the opportunity to be doing the things that make them the most happy. So please join me in thanking Brian for the, the leadership that he's brought to the division and in working with me on the National Toxicology Program. So Brian, I, I think I'm speaking for all of us. We wish you the best in the next phase of your scientific pursuits. So actually we can have a, a virtual, virtual round of, uh, of applause for the leadership that Brian has brought to uh, to the division. Thanks for that, Rick. Appreciate it. Great. Now, again, we, we really enjoyed working with you. And uh, again, it's uh, we wish you the best. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, just very quickly. Uh, so we want to bring in a person on a deep, what we call in government, a detail, someone who would be, be able to step in in a temporary role. Uh, to function as the director of the DTT. And so we will be getting out information on this uh, very, very soon. Uh, Mary Jacobson in the office of the director is working with me to coordinate this. And we're using this as an opportunity. It'll be a competitive process. So we're using it as an opportunity for uh, individuals who have not had a chance to function in a scientific director position to actually try it on for size um, and to, and to potentially determine whether this is something that they would want to pursue in the longer term. So it is a temporary position. It's a detailed position. We're hoping we can get someone in place by November of 2022. They'll have a couple of months of overlap with Brian, and then they'll be on their own at the end of January uh, 2023. So stay tuned on that. If there's any interest, uh, you know, just let us know. We'll be, we were hoping to do this more broadly, including, say, GS 1415s, but it turns out that the, the human resources uh, issues just make it very complicated. So we're going to be limiting this to the current Title 42 F scientist at the NIH. So I also wanna let you know that we're assembling a search committee to identify the permanent scientific director. And we hope to have that underway. It's, we have here on the slide on November, 2022, uh, January, 2023. Uh, 
So we, it might might be maybe more toward the end of November 2022 or early December 2022. But uh, stay tuned, and uh, we'll be getting the advertisements out, and hopefully we can get that search underway and to identify the next director of the DTT as quickly as possible. So let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, and I also want to, many of you have asked in the past, uh, so I'll be proactive. I'll let you know that we have some, actually some good news in terms of movement on identifying the next uh, permanent director for the Division of Extramural Research and Training. So I wanna start off by thanking Drs. Uh, Courtney Aiklin and Wilson Compton for co-chairing the search committee. They assembled what was a truly an engaged and a diverse committee. They advertised the position, they reviewed uh, quite a number of candidates and they referred the top two candidates to me at the end of August. So I'll be asking these top candidates to interview for the position during the month of October. And we'll have them give an all hands presentation and then meet with members of the staff and uh, pro then provide me with input, I'll make a decision. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll have a permanent director for DERT in place uh, sometime relatively soon. So it's good to see that we're getting some movement on this. And again, thank you for uh, both, both Courtney and Wilson. It's been a lot of work uh, doing this. And actually thank you to Spencer Smith who provided a lot of the administrative support uh, to make the search committee run smoothly. So let's go to the next slide, please. So I wanna talk about some recent events. Let's go to the next slide. So one event that happened since we were together uh, in June of 2022 was the EHS CC annual meeting. So this year it was hosted by Mount Sinai and the focus of the meeting was, uh, quote, a path to address racism and health inequities. So Dr. Bob Wright and his uh, colleagues put together, you know, just a, an absolutely terrific meeting. It was my second in-person meeting over the past couple of years. <clears throat> and it was just delightful to be in the conference room, the, the auditorium at the New York Academy of Medicine. There were 275 individuals that attended in person, including more than 60 community engagement core leaders from centers across the country. So I could feel the energy. I think we could all feel the energy. It felt good to be in the room together and talk about the wonderful science that we do as part of the environmental health sciences community. Now, given the focus of the meeting, we were delighted that Dr. Ken Olden agreed to join us to kick, uh, to provide the, the keynote kickoff uh, presentation for the meeting. So Ken, as, he is, as expected, um, he gave a brilliant talk and provided us with a perspective on the impact of the environment and human health, especially with a strong focus on those uh, most vulnerable communities. So he, he emphasized that building trust with communities is critical, something that I think NIHS was one of the first uh, institutes out of, the, out of the blocks to really recognize that's the way you have to, you have to engage communities to get things done. And it was actually especially delightful to hear the stories of the early days during Ken's tenure as the director of NIHS. And I'll tell you in just a couple of minutes, uh, all these were recorded. So if you wanna hear Ken's presentation, there'll be an opportunity for you to click on that URL and to uh, hear his presentation and actually listen to some of those interesting stories from back in the days during his tenure as director of NIHS. Next slide. So very briefly here, the first section involved multiple talks that described best practices on the recruitment and retention of historically marginalized uh, black, indigenous uh, people of color, trainees and faculty. So this was followed by a very engaging session focused on the NIEHS DR2 network. So there were various presentations during the session. And again, they emphasized the importance of developing plans developing the infrastructure and the relationships that are necessary for time-sensitive investigations in the after aftermath of disasters. You don't wanna wait until the disaster happens, you wanna be planning ahead of time so that you're ready to deploy your resources once a disaster happens. The uh, speakers also described how to build resilient communities. Again, the, the presentations are, going, are, are available, so you can take a look at these things. So the final plenary session highlighted the climate change and health programs across the core centers. And what I learned at this core center meeting is that the directors and our core centers, there's a lot of interest in the whole area of the health impacts of climate change. 
So the speakers in this session uh, described how the community, you know, the scientific community is engaging on a local and national and a global scale to address the health impacts of climate change. And of note, there were community engagement, epidemiology and climate impact modeling presentation. In fact, following up on the meeting, the core center directors, when I met with them, uh, they indicated they're going to be huddling to see if there are some specific collaborative programs working together uh, that they can be engaging in around this topic of the health impacts of climate change. So hopefully we'll be hearing more of those details sometime relatively soon. So again, as I mentioned, all of the sessions were recorded, so you can access them at, uh, at the URL shown at the bottom of the page. And I suspect you're not going to remember that URL. So can someone put that URL in the chat box or make it available to everyone who happens to be on the Zoom session today? I also want to point out before moving on, as part of the Core Center uh, program, you know, the director of NIHS has a chance to meet with um, you know, staff and uh, in various breakout sessions. Um, so I met with, uh, we had some engaging breakout sessions with staff who run the functional cores and with members of the community engagement cores. So one issue that came up is how do we define translation? I was actually surprised to hear that, uh, but I need to be clear that translation doesn't, does not necessarily mean just moving our research into the clinic. I mean, it could, but uh, this may have been a priority in, in the past or past directors, uh, but it's not my priority. And I don't think it's the priority of my colleagues here at uh, NIHS as well. And hopefully all of you know, our DERT colleagues came up with a translation framework. So if you wanna know what translation means to uh, us here at NIHS, I suggest you take a look at this document. Uh, also, in the community engagement discussions, uh, we made it clear that you don't need a doctorate to be a leader of the community engagement core. So that came up once again, but hopefully we've made it abundantly clear. You need someone who has those capabilities and can provide the leadership to the community engagement core that they don't necessarily have, need to have a doctorate. So let's go on to the next slide. So of course, it's not too early to start planning for next year's annual meeting. It'll be hosted by Cheryl Walker and her colleagues at the Baylor College of Medicine. So best to get this on your calendar now, October 17th and 19th, 2023 in Houston. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk briefly about PFAS. So this is a topic that has emerged uh, recently. So many of us uh, as part of the National Toxicology Program have had a chance to brief uh, Admiral Levine, who I report to in my role as the director of the National Toxicology Program. We briefed her uh, last November. And uh, what we discovered is that this, this is a topic of great interest to her because she comes from Pennsylvania, where there's a PFAS is a big problem in Pennsylvania. But I, I wish that it was only Pennsylvania where PFAS was a problem. So PFAS has been with us for decades, uh, starting with PFO and PFOS. I think it's PFO and PFOS back in the 40s and the 50s. And what we discovered is that these wonderful nonstick compounds that work so well with our pots and our pans and worked especially well in keeping our hikey boots dry and waterproof have serious health effects. But we've also come to realize that PFAS are those quote forever chemicals and that there's no biological mechanism and process that is designed to, uh, to break that CF bond. So they're going to be with us forever on the planet earth, it's pretty sobering. So moreover, these chemicals have a, they, they've actually become ubiquitous in the marketplace. And through the NHANES study, we now know that 90%, 97% of us, 97% uh, of Americans have some level of these chemicals in their bodies. So we also discussed that there are many challenges associated with studying these chemicals with uh, probably the most remarkable challenge being that there are anywhere between you know, 10 or 12,000. Every time I get this number, it seems that it, it bumps up somewhat. So more recently, I heard that it's up to 12,000 different chemical species that fall under this umbrella of PFAS. Next slide. Let me just pause for a second, just make sure that I'm still coming through okay and you can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so where do we stand with respect to the health uh, effects of PFAS and what guidance do physicians give to their patients on the topic of PFAS? 
So to address these issues, NIEHS actually uh, under the leadership of Brian Barrage uh, the, in the now the DTT, actually joined forces with Pat Bricey and others at uh, ATSDR to support an ad hoc committee of the, of the NASM. So this group reviewed the extensive literature available on PFAS. So they've conducted some community listening sessions. And they found that there's an association be between PFAS exposure uh, and decreased antibody response, uh, dyslipidemia, decreased infant and fetal growth, and an increased risk of kidney cancer. So these uh, risks increase with increasing serum levels in individuals. And uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this in tomorrow morning's session. Next slide. Let's go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Okay, so somehow there's something's wrong with my slides here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, here we are. So in fact, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Dr. Ray, uh, from ATSDR will summarize the NASM report. Uh, Dr. Barrage will then summarize the approaches that the DTT plans to take to address the challenges moving forward with PFAS. And Dr. Hoppen from NCSU, uh, who's one of our grantees, will provide a summary of their work on GenX, which is a molecular species, one of those 12,000 different molecular species of a PFAS that's contaminating the environment across major sections in North Carolina. Although actually PFAS Gen X may be not just one molecular species, maybe a, a complicated mixture that's uh, difficult to analyze. So we'll hear more about that tomorrow. And we'll also finish the discussion of this on this topic with a presentation by Elliot, Dr. Elliot, on the ethical and social issues relating to PFAS. I'm sorry, Trevor, was there a question? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so there's still a lot of work that, uh, that needs to be done, and there are many challenges that the, uh, the environmental health sciences community needs to address. So we'll have a chance to talk about that tomorrow. Next slide. So let me just uh, comment on strategic planning, uh, where, next slide. So when I became the permanent director back in June of 2020, you may have heard me say that I felt that the existing strategic plan still provided a framework to guide the work at the Institute. So that was true because I think as many of you know, I was the deputy director and I worked together, uh, together with Dr. Birnbaum to help craft that plan. So I just didn't see that it was necessary to disrupt the implementation of what I thought was a pretty good plan that pretty accurately uh, defined some of the strategic directions for the Institute. But we are now approaching 2023, the end of that five-year plan. So we need to start the next phase of our strategic planning. So the world has changed, especially over the past few years, and we'll need to update the plan to reflect these changes. So Dr. Newton will be giving a presentation. I think she's actually next, if I remember correctly. Uh, she'll be talking about the process that we'll be using. So you may recall that uh, when Sheila and I worked with all of you to develop the original plan and Dr. Birnbaum, and uh, we used an open space framework back in 2011. So, um, and you'll see that there may be elements of that open space framework that we can uh, utilize using a virtual format to get input from all of you across the environmental health sciences community. So you'll be again, hearing more of the details on this uh, during the presentation by Dr. Newton. So let me go on to the next slide. So let me move now into the whole areas of the research strategies. So you recall that I shared five different emerging areas of scientific focus at the June council meeting. Let me go on, uh, I think, let me, I think it's, in, yeah, here we are, good. So, and you'll recall that I shared you know, these five different emerging areas of scientific focus at the, the June Council meeting. And as I explained, these are not the only areas of focus for the future. We'll, we'll have a better sense of what those are once we've completed the next phase of our strategic plan. But these are five areas of focus that are ones that the Senior Leadership Committee has been working together with me. And, um, and we've been doing this since I've been named the Permanent Director of NIEHS. These five areas are precision environmental health in the exposome, computational biology and data science, uh, climate change and health, environmental justice and health disparities, and mechanistic and translational toxicology. 
Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to update you on the progress we've been making on all of these areas. Uh, rather, I will focus on what we've done uh, since June in precision environmental health, focusing on precision environmental health, the exposome, and climate change and health. And then I'm hoping to open this up for a pretty robust interaction with all of the rest of you on council. Next slide. So this first area of focus you know, is, uh, is one that I first, you know, precision environmental health, I first became aware of the, the, you know, the title of this uh, when we asked uh, Cheryl Walker, Andrea Baccarelli, and Andrea uh, Dana Dolanoy to give a presentation at council. I think it was about a year and a half ago. And so as you may recall uh, in my discussion of this, I think it was last June, this is a program all about recognizing that individuals respond to the environmental exposures in different ways. So this program nicely dovetails with the precision medicine program that Dr. Collins and others um, have been promoting or you know, developed and promoted. And it's also precision medicine is connected with the million person, all of us cohort at the NIH. So while the precision medicine program is currently about genetic variations that confer differential susceptibility um, in individuals, the precision environmental health program goes beyond just genetic predisposition uh, and it incorporates underlying genetic, it, it also incorporates the underlying epigenetic variations that can give rise uh, to changes in gene expression from environmental exposures. And these could also happen during the course of development, very important. So it's about trying to identify the genetic and the genomic signals that uh, regulate how our genes are working, how they're being expressed. And in the end, Cheryl, Andrea, and Dana explained that this will allow us to better understand the individual risk to prevent disease. And as Cheryl indicated in her presentation, her precision environmental health is about working at the intersection of genetics, environmental health, and data science. So all of this would be for the purpose of better understanding those gene by environment interactions. So let's go to the next slide. So the key, of course, to identifying the uh, the G by E effects is to ultimately understand the genes and the variations within those genes that predispose to differential responses to environmental exposures. And what we know is that the genetic predisposition to various G by E effects fall generally in this category of complex traits. So what this means is that there may be, it's not just one gene or one gene variant, it means that there may be many potentially hundreds of different gene variants across the genome that are responsible for this genetic uh, predisposition. So identifying these uh, uh, gene variants will be a challenge. And as I discussed last June, one possibility is for us to join forces with the ICDA, this International Common Disease Alliance uh, that was launched back in September of 2019. And the ICDA is really about bringing together the international human genetics community under a shared vision, vision to collaborate and develop new ideas and principles, really to develop those common procedures so that we can seamlessly share data. And if we do this well, we can actually find ourselves in a position where we potentially have tens of millions of highly genetically diverse individuals from across the globe. And again, if we inter interact with the ICDA member organizations, uh, this should give us the ability to provide the means to identify those gene variants, the complex traits associated with differential responses to environmental exposures. But uh, one of the challenges is that, and I think I talked about this last June, is the ICDA is currently not systematically collecting environmental exposure data. So I think uh, we're helping them to better understand that you know, people can get sick. There are going to be people in those cohorts that they're studying that are developing adverse health effects, not just because of their genetic complement, uh, but there may be environmental perturbations that are solely responsible for the phenotype or contribute and a gene by environment effect. So what we have to do, we've taken up the challenge and we're working with the ICDA to incorporate environmental exposures into the framework of the ICDA. So the next slide, please. So as a tangible step in the direction of incorporate environmental exposure data, we've been working with Jeff Ginsburg and Josh Denny. Uh, so Jeff is the chief uh, Chief Scientific and Medical Officer of the All of Us Program, and Josh Denny is the exec Chief Executive Officer of the All of Us Program. <clears throat> and again, just to remind you that the All of Us Program is the highly diverse one million person cohort at the NIH that is the basis for the Precision Medicine Program. It's part of the ICDA. 
So both Jeff and Josh recognize that the environment plays an important role in human health. And there's a need to incorporate environmental exposures into the All of Us program. So I was very pleased that both uh, Jeff and Josh uh, made the commitment to travel to North Carolina for a two-day workshop last, uh, it was last July, entitled Integrating Climate and Environmental Data and Justice into the All of Us Research Program. So Richard Kwok, you know, David Belshaw, Jan Paul, Allison Mutzinger Reif, and several other our colleagues across the NIHS community worked together with the All of Us staff to bring together over 120 different experts in the fields of environmental health, the data privacy, biostatistics, climate change, epigenetics, genomics, and epidemiology. So each day there was a featured a presentation there are followed by breakout sessions to identify data gaps and solutions for those data gaps. So next slide. So I'm getting a little tight on time here. So just to, we'll say that there are three different goals uh, for, for the workshop. And I think the, uh, I just, I think I'm gonna skip over this slide here. So let's go to the next slide. So what we did as a result of this workshop is we came up with a number of ideas for ancillary studies. And so an ancillary study is one that could be done in partnership, in partnership with the All of Us data, be done by either adding participants outside the current uh, recruitment audience for the All of Us, or by adding new data collected from either the whole cohort or a subset of the All of Us cohort. And the key, I think, is that the tools to collect the data need to be amenable to the large scale population of the All of Us cohort. So the good news is that at the end of the workshop, it was a very robust session where we came up with 17 different ancillary study designs that were proposed. And I know David Belshaw is working together with Jeff Ginsburg and others. Uh, so hopefully sometime maybe in February, when I report to all of you, we'll have some specific details on what those ancillary studies will look like. So getting environmental health data into the all of us and then into the ICDA program. Next slide. So I think just to move things along here, I, I suspect, you know, you heard me talk about the exposome at the June council meeting, and I'm sure that you're all aware that, you know, this is absolutely an emerging consensus that if we truly want to understand the impact of the environment, we need to develop research strategies that go beyond studying one exposure at the time. So the exposome is precisely that research framework and will factor in the totality of exposures over the life course. And as you can see, and, and I, I suspect most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the exposome framework and it goes from physical chemical agents, uh, but it also includes diets, psychosocial mental stress, socioeconomic status, uh, issues of inequality and environmental justice and impacts of the built environment. So it also includes uh, measuring levels of physical activity, sleep behavior, drug and alcohol abuse. So many of us have been using this, you know, quote unquote, expose home um, you know, framework uh, since 2005, but what's becoming as clear, especially for investigators outside the environmental health sciences community, we need to better define how do you collect exposomics data? What does it actually mean? Next slide. So again, Gary, I'm gonna use a slide that cross-references a presentation you gave to this council before you were actually officially a member of the council. So Gary indicated, you know, and Gary has been uh, right at uh, working together with other members of the environmental sciences community on the whole exposome project. So we need to define, uh, we need an operational definition. So we need to define how do we do an exposomics experiment? So he explained to all of us in council and to the environmental sciences community that uh, we need to develop new technologies to capture the exposome. So we need to start with technologies that we have, um, and then we can develop new technologies uh, over the course of time. So let's get started with the tools that we currently have available. You know, one would be uh, some very powerful tools being high resolution mass spectrometry. So we've got a lot of work to do. Next slide, let me just continue on here. So to, to get to the point where we have an operational model of exposomics, so a large group of individuals uh, from across the environmental health sciences community developed a series of five workshops that uh, just finished last month. And the goal of these workshops was to make a pivotal shift from defining the exposome to actually doing it, so operationalizing it. 
So by doing the uh, by doing this, the idea was to help position exposomics to be at the intersection of environmental and, and uh, health disease research. So there was an open space format that was used, and uh, and this allowed for a broad base of participation from across the global uh, biomedical biomedical and environmental health sciences community. Next slide. So the see here what is going on let's go to the next slide somehow my slide deck here is uh, is a little bit mixed up i don't know how this happened um Let's go to, go to the previous slide. So I just just to summarize this, I think that the I think it's it's fair to say that the workshops were a smashing success. So we had over four hundred colleagues, as you can see on the slide, uh, from across the biomedical community that joined for summer all of the workshops, and there were sixty four different topics that were raised and discussed. So Michelle Bennett and her colleagues collected the reports from all the workshops, and they're currently available online. So if you can see in the lower right-hand corner, there is a, a URL. And uh, if and if can someone actually put that into the chat box so that you don't we don't have to remember that? So take a look. All these reports are available. And if you're interested in knowing what happened at these workshops, next slide. But the, the final step will be to bring to, together members of the organizing committee, the senior leadership committee, and many of you on council at what we're calling the Exposomic Summit, which will happen immediately after council. We'll give you a few minutes to have lunch, then we're going to dig right into this. So the participants will address the five major topic clusters that emerged from the summer workshops. You know, what do we measure? How to, how to measure it? How to share, integrate, harmonize, analyze, and interpret the data? And then how to translate and use the data in impactful ways. So in the end, I hope that we will emerge from this summit with a plan and a strategy for operationalizing the exposome. And to do this in a way that we can truly begin to evaluate the totality of exposure over the life course. Next slide. So let me move on to the third area here. Uh, you heard quite a bit of this at the June, well, it's the November special session of the November Council uh, last year, as well as at the June uh, meeting. So this, you know, this third area of focus is about climate change and health. And it all came to the fore when President Biden issued the executive order 14008. He made it very clear that this is a very high priority for his administration. And he pointed to the NIH to take a leadership role and to, uh, to, to study the health impacts of climate change. As I mentioned to you last June, you know, I've uh, taken the initiative to join forces with uh, you know, six other IC directors that are shown on the slide here that you know, I covered this previously. We formed an executive committee that has re-energized a working group with membership from across the NIH. Uh, it's co-chaired by Aubrey Miller and Josh Rosenthal. And Gwen Coleman is working as the a central coordinator to keep all of the different uh, parts of this, this project uh, moving in synchrony with each other. So let's go to the next slide. So as one of the really important things that the working group has done is they put together this, this framework uh, for climate change and health research. And I'm not gonna go through the details on this. Uh, this is all posted on the nih.gov forward slash climate and health. So there are four different core elements of this, but it really outlines that this will be a, a global, highly collaborative effort. And it's multidisciplinary work, a transformative research. So the, the cogs on the outside really represent uh, the, the diversity of the different types of science and research that will have to happen in support of climate change and health. So we developed a URL for climate change and health. Again, I just want to point out this, uh, this climate and health uh, at the lower left-hand corner here. So if you're interested in the framework or interested in you know, anything related to climate and health, take a look at that website. Next slide. 
Now, one of the things I mentioned uh, during the budget presentation is that we were hoping that we would have $100 million in our back pocket uh, that we could use to help catalyze some important new projects uh, in the health effects of climate change. That didn't come through, uh, but we're hoping that there may be some additional funding coming through uh, in FY23. But uh, I want to add that you know, the executive committee assembled after the budget appropriations uh, happened. And so we've all decided that this is an important enough topic area. We can't wait for new funding from Congress. So all members of the executive committee um, actually got out their checkbooks. And uh, together with Drs. Tabak and Schwetz from the Office of the Director in Bethesda, along with Dr. Gottesman and Shore in the Office of the Deputy Director for Intermural Research. We all provided some funding, some startup funding for a number of initiatives that cross the intramural and the extramural programs across the NIH. So this slide shows us some of those programs. These include the development of a research coordinating center to bring together NIH funded researchers with scientific community and interagency partners, all for the purpose of advancing the science of climate change and health. So the center will help to manage the data, build research capacity, and advance the priorities uh, that are part of that strategic framework. So additionally, we found some startup funding to support uh, what we're calling the Alliance for Community Engagement. Uh, it's focused, well, the, the Alliance for Community Engagement specifically focused on climate change and health. We're calling this the ACE, A-C-E dash C-C-H. This alliance will help the NIH to engage with communities. Again, community engagement is really important. And uh, we wanna be engaging with those communities that are most impacted by climate change. And these uh, include the underserved and racial and ethnic minorities, as well as rural population. So this ACCH builds on the successful model that was established by NHLDI and NIMHD to address the health disparities research issues uh, around COVID-19. So the ACCH will work in close collaboration with community partners. And uh, so we think we're in a great position to really engage those uh, underserved uh, racial, ethnic minority and rural populations. So let me see here. And uh, members of the Climate Change and Health Working Group have been engaging with their ICs to help get the word out that we are interested in supporting investigator-initiated proposals through our just our regular pipelines. So if you've got some ideas about, uh, a well, if you've got some ideas, put it in the form of a proposal to address the climate change of health and get it, get it uh, submitted through the, the normal mechanisms. But as part of this, there will also be NOCES that are becoming out in the next fiscal year that articulate the relevance of developing and adapting practical technologies for capturing the health effects of climate change. And this would be in the SBIR and STTR applications. So next slide. So I'm almost finished here I, in the, the, this new program portfolio on climate change and health. Uh, we've initiated a new program and it's called the NIH Climate and Health Scholars Program. So this program will provide support to bring extramural scientists, could be some of you, uh, into working, uh, actually onto campus, working with the climate change and health uh, staff at the NIH. So scholars would be invited to collaborate with NIH staff on one or more activities. Uh, and these could be related to research, training, and policy. And it'll be a unique opportunity for scientists from outside the US federal government to share the, your, your knowledge and you bring your interest and your passion around climate change and health with, uh, and you can share that with NIH laboratories and the intramural program, for example, uh, as well as with program officers and others. Now, I'll just note here that uh, today's the 13th. The applications are due in a couple of days on September 15th. So if you want the details, if it sounds interesting and you want to pass it to someone else, again, climate and health, nih.gov forward slash climate and health. So next slide. I just also want to just point out that there is a lot of interest uh, in the climate, uh, the health effects of climate change in our intramural program. So Dr. Zeldin yeah, took up the challenge and worked together with other scientific directors from across the NIH, and they put together a framework of a program called ITCH which is, uh, as you can see here, it stands for the Intramural Targeted Climate Change and Health Program. So this concept was universally endorsed by the executive committee. 
And Drs. Gottesman and Short uh, actually provided some startup funding. And we threw in a little bit of extra funding as well, uh, just to make sure that a number of different projects could be supported. So as you can see here, it's, uh, it's building that capacity. So we want to get things going in the extramural community. We want to get things going in the intramural community. Climate change and health isn't going away. So we're doing what we can with the funding we have available to really develop the type of base of, of, of the infrastructure so that climate change and health becomes integral to the work that we do going forward. So next slide, and this is my last slide here. Um, so it's, it's visit the Climate and Health website if you want more information about the initiative and the framework. And, uh, and if you wanna know more about funding announcements, uh, both the ones we have out there now with the modest amount of startup funding and hopefully with some additional money uh, that may become available in the future. So I also wanna just point out that there are public seminar series in this topic area. And uh, we have a very robust literature portal, which has access, which would give all of you access to most relevant scientific information related to the health impacts of climate change. So let's go. I think that's the last slide, if I remember correctly. Yep, here we are. So let's uh, stop sharing the slides and let's open it up for general discussion. So members of council, what are your thoughts? Um, so are we on the right track? Are there specific things that you have concerns about that you want to, to make sure that we're aware of as we continue to make progress? So Karen, it looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, Rick, really great presentation. A lot of exciting things going on and, and moving in the right directions. I don't have a lot of comments there. What I would like to say is you mentioned a lot of things, big, big studies that require a lot of people and a lot of funds. And I think that you did, you did mention mechanistic studies in toxicology, but I think I sort of think of it like a puzzle, right? Trying to figure out gene environment interactions in particular. Um, it's, it's this big puzzle. And when we just take a little piece like mechanistic studies, we take a little piece and we maybe not, don't see the whole picture, but without the little pieces, we have no puzzle. So there's no picture at all. So I do think we need to focus and I know you do, and I know that you agree with this, but I just only saw it in one spot, but with limited funds, big data, big money, I think we should really um, make an effort to focus on mechanistic studies to understand those interactions, because in just determining all of the data together, how do we piece that together to actually make an individualized medicine or treatment, right? So we have to understand the actual mechanistic details. Um, that I'll, I'll just stop there, but I, I think you would agree. I just meant, wanted to bring that up. Well, let me, let me assure you, I would agree. And again, my challenge is to always figure out what can I tell you in, in 30 to 45 minutes, uh, just to kind of nucleate uh, your thinking uh, to give us some feedback. But uh, I'm, I know I'm, I mean, I'm very interested. And I know that uh, this was a huge element of Dr. Barrett's vision uh, for the, what we call the now the DTT is really getting beyond just uh, injecting different doses of things into say different inbred strains of mice, but really getting to at the mechanistic details. And it's, it's not that this hasn't happened in the past, but to really think about how to integrate this in a more proactive way going forward. And this will be integral to understanding gene by environment effects and to doing essentially all the things that I've described today. So Karen, I'm really glad that you, you pointed that out. And uh, my expectation is that uh, maybe I'll take that up as a topic area and uh, to get a more robust discussion with all of you at the meeting in February. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Rick. Great. Thanks for that. And, if I can in inject it here as well, and it's actually one of the themes that we're going to be talking about in the Exposome Summit coming up is how we can use model systems to simplify the, the analysis of the exposome and generate that linkage data that provides us possibility. So yeah. Karen, I'm, I'm completely on the same page as you. Thank you, David. I Just one last comment about that. You know, it may be best that, you know, multi-PI R01s or PL1s really work well in that format because you can take the big picture and bring it down to the small details with working in groups. But mm -hmm. thank you. Yep, that's great. Well, we have to provide those mechanisms to reward that type of group and collaborative activity. So we're working on it. Phil, I think you were next, and then Trevor has his hand up too. So Phil, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, great presentations, great initiatives. Uh, my compliments to all involved. They're really important things. Uh, just one thought and comment, and really about the climate change and health. 
I mean, it's such a big issue, a big area. Uh, and you're obviously leading in this in some ways, but I'm just interested in what's happening internationally. And is it an opportunity to uh, sort of integrate with other efforts across, you know, across the across the globe? Because you know, I, we, you know, I don't think traditionally that's been done enough, particularly when new initiatives start. It seems like an opportunity. Well, Phil, I think that's that's a really good point. And I'm going to ask Gwen. I know that this is an area that she is especially interested in. I know Gwen, are you are you on? And I, the, the short answer is, Phil, that I think we all recognize that climate change doesn't end on the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States. This is a global issue, and we need to be developing global strategies. I mean, for example, we had a meeting with the Wellcome Trust, um, and the Wellcome Trust has made climate, you know, the health impacts of climate change as one of their three major thrusts, and they're putting billions of pounds behind these efforts. And so, you know, my, my comment to them, and I think they're fully aware of this, we, you know, this is a big, complicated, and uh, nuanced challenge going forward. And we need to be doing this uh, in a way where we're not tripping over each other, but we're doing this in a way that we can be providing complementary capabilities. We need to be developing, for example, databases uh, to collect the information. And I'm hoping that uh, much of the exposure data from uh, climate change and health will be coming using the exposomics framework. So the, the succinct answer to your question is, uh, we've been talking with people on a, on a global scale. There's a lot of interest. Roger Glass, you may have noticed, is one of the uh, okay. members of the executive committee for uh, climate change and health. And he has brought a very, um, a very conscious effort to get this um, happening on a more global scale. You know, uh, people in low and middle income countries, and there are going to be whole nations that are going to be underwater in just a few, few, um, a few years, a few decades, uh, if we don't do something. So yes, um, we're, we're thinking of this on a more global scale. Phil, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And I, it's great that you're thinking that way. I'm just thinking about what's happened in the past. It's sort of Either there is a very high level of agreement that sort of comes through the heroes group or something like that. Uh, and that leads to some things, but not really a true global initiatives. And then there are things that are true global initiatives. They're actually started by the, the scientists themselves, but don't necessarily have the resources they need. I mean, GA4GH is an example uh, that sort of, you know, more of a grassroots beginnings and, and grown into something very extensive. So it just seems like there's plenty of room in the middle ground uh, where the individual institutes, uh, you know, you could get get together with your, your counterparts in the other parts of the world and really make a difference. No, I, and again, I totally agree with you. And in my whole approach as the director of NIHS, as uh, you know, I'm thinking, I'm bringing a collaborative, a collaborative um, approach to this because it is a large, complicated problem. I mean, the money was, uh, you know, the $100 million, so hopefully we'll actually get that, will come to the NIHS budget. And the easiest thing is just to work together with the environmental health sciences community, do something within our silo and try to make some things happen. But, uh, you know, it's, I consciously reached out, let's put together a, an executive committee, let's form a governance group so we get the rest of the NIH involved. They're interested and they can bring additional resources. And then moving this beyond just the United States, uh, it's it's critically important. So it's from my, you know, just like with data science, Phil, uh, we've got to have a framework for how do we do things collaboratively, and let's uh, let's make sure that we we don't make the mistake of getting out and spending a lot of money and doing a lot of things because we're all passionate about getting some things done, only to realize that maybe that wasn't the best way to develop a collaborative relationships. So let's let's do some careful thinking and talking ahead of time. And uh, and at the same time, trying to get them some, th some things going. I think the RCC and the ACCH, uh, these are infrastructure programs that will help to support the things that we're talking about. Okay, Trevor, it looks like you're next. And then Terry has his hand up after you. Uh, uh, thank you, Rick. So first of all, I'd like to build on the conversation about uh, climate change and health. As you indicated, Rick, at the uh, annual meeting of the Environmental Health Sciences Core Centers, uh, the uh, 
issue came up to develop an intercenter working group on climate change and health. And uh, we actually had a bi-monthly meeting of the center directors at the end of August, and there was unanimity to proceed with the intercenter working group with the concept of being collaborative. Because as you indicate in your comments, and as Phil indicated, this is a much larger issue than any single person or any single center can take on. But by working together, we can accomplish a lot more. And so the next step that we're doing is actually putting out a, a baseline survey to actually capture what is actually going on in the individual centers and also to identify needs and research gaps that we can perhaps take on with an emphasis on the cogwheel model that you actually had in, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Great. But, well, Trevor. Uh, yep. Oh, Trevor, I'm, I'm very pleased. I know that you, you were particular, I think, brought this up at that uh, meeting with me and my colleagues. So I'm very pleased to hear that you've been making progress. Unfortunately, I haven't heard some of the details, but I look forward to uh, doing what I can to support uh, it. It was, it was very, I must say, uh, your interest and the other course center director's interest in this, uh, there was an energy in the room that uh, we want to capitalize on. And I just encourage you continue to, to work together. And your collaboration is one of my leadership values. Uh, this is a big problem, multifaceted, and we need to be working carefully together. So charge on. So actually, Mike, my, my, I had one other comment to make, and that was to come back to the comment about mechanistic toxicology in the strategic plan. And so um, I think that moving forward, some emphasis has to be put into place in terms of identi identifying adverse outcome pathway constructs. Uh, these are not just pathways, they're actually systems based. But if we understand the patterns that uh, underpin uh, molecular initiating events and key events that then follow, we have a way to do predictive toxicology, just not on a single compound, but compounds that fall into the same class and compounds that fall in different classes that have the same adverse outcome pathway construct. So what I'm saying is, is that we need a lot of emphasis, not just on mechanistic toxicology, but the computational and machine learning that is gonna be required to bring these two things together. Yeah, Trevor, I, I, I agree with that totally. And I'll, I'll also add that to make the machine learning and the artificial intelligence capabilities possible, we need to pay attention to the collection of data annotation and making sure that we have the best possible data sets to do the types of things you were just describing. So I don't know if Phil wants to, if he agrees with me or disagrees with me at that point. I see a thumbs up. And I, I think that's one of our challenges. Um, and, uh, but again, it's the extent to which NIEHS, we can provide leadership working together with you and other uh, core center directors. Uh, let's make sure that we're collecting the data in a way that it becomes seamlessly integratable and powerful, you know, creating these powerful uh, data repositories to enable this to happen. The concept. Trevor, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does, yeah. Okay, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Phil, you want to make a comment and then we'll go to Terry. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to say the concept we're discussing later this afternoon is going to address some of that and it's really important. Yep, sounds good. Uh, Terry, do you have a final comment here? Yes, have, uh, th thanks. Thanks, Rick. And, and again, wonderful presentation. Uh, really happy to see all of the wonderful things that the Institute's doing and the directions you're um, uh, continuing to pursue. So again, a little just a quick question on the climate and health and the scholars program. Uh, would that program be uh, open to um, community members that might be part of our Keck centers and the various programs? And uh, how about students, uh, postdocs as future leaders in these areas? Is the scholars program at least broad enough to handle some of some of those um, potential clients, if you will? Yeah, that's a great question. And my understanding is, and again, I don't know if is is Gwen on this one or Gwen or I'm Aubrey to step or, off to the NINR council. So she's oh, okay. She's at NINR. So my understanding is that it's pretty broad based, uh, Terry. So take a look at the climate and health, and if. If that doesn't answer your question, you know, send me a note and I'll get you okay. an answer here uh, very quickly. The deadline is approaching. So send okay. me a note here quickly. And uh, so it's a way, you know, that um, that we'd like to get people from, you know, outside the federal government 
and uh, whether they're members of communities or members of universities, uh, you know, just people who have knowledge on climate, the health effects of climate change, we want to, to provide them with the means to bring their knowledge into the planning process at the NIH. Great. I don't, thank uh, you. I don't think there should be any restrictions on who actually applies. So Claudia, actually, Claudia, you probably know the answer to that. Yeah, the, the one comment I wanted to make was that it really is not intended for students, graduate students or postdocs. It really is intended for individuals who have been um, maybe not super senior, but really have a pedigree in climate change because it is working with intramural scientists and others to really or collaboratively in bringing climate change expertise to the NIH broadly. Okay, thanks, Claudia. Thanks for that clarification. So Terry, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay, well, let me turn back to, where's Pat? Or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm turn this back to David. Yep. So David, um, I think we run out of time. We probably should move on. Yep, yep, thanks, Rick. Uh, so next topic of, of discussion on our agenda, I think you're, feeds right into this, um, is uh, for Dr. Sheila Newton, who is the, the deputy director of our new SCOPE. Um, I won't try to repeat what the acronym is, um, uh, who's going to give an overview of our strategic planning effort that, that she's going to be leading on behalf of the Institute. But I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for everybody to contribute. Sheila? Absolutely. Thank you very much, David. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great, great. So yes, uh, I am the now the deputy director of the, the Office of Strategic Coordination, Planning and Evaluation is our acronym. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, so thank you very much. And I'm also, I'm very happy to be here again because uh, it's always really exciting when we start to enter a new um, strategic plan development period. And I, I've had the honor to work with uh, Rick on the past two strategic plans in his um, capacity as deputy director during Linda's tenure. And so I think it's really exciting for us now to be undertaking uh, the development of another strategic plan now with uh, Rick in his um, position as an IEHS director. So uh, let's see, can I, I can control, can I, I thought I would be able to, I guess. Um, yes, just click two times maybe, in the center of the slide. Just, oh, two slide. times, okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, oh, sorry. For the past three and a half years, NIEHS has been guided by the goals articulated in the current strategic plan, advancing environmental health sciences and improving health. Um, I know that this plan is probably familiar to many or all of you, but it's now time to begin the process of evaluating our goals and plans as an institute to create a new strategic plan to guide us through the next five years. Before I get into our process for, oops, before I get into our process for updating and creating a new strategic plan for NIEHS, it's important to note that we have some specific requirements on our next plan that did not exist in 2018. As a result of language in the 21st Century Cures Act, Congress now requires not only that NIH must have a strategic plan, NIH ICs must all have strategic plans, but that also uh, NIH and the component ICs must all use a common template for their strategic plans. And the strategic plan template uh, determines the format and some of the content buckets for our plan, but it doesn't tell us you know, what to say. We still have control of our, of our content and our priorities and goals. Let's see. So what does the NIH common template require? This is an outline of the common template that was developed and must be used by all IC strategic plans published after 2019. 
It's actually a very flexible format and it meant to me meet the needs of all the institutes and centers. And um, full disclosure, it was in development during the time we were finalizing our last strategic plan. And I had the opportunity to be on the planning officer group that developed this template. So um, we were in a position to uh, sort of help make sure that it met our needs. Um, so these are the main components of the NIH common template. You've probably seen that if you've seen the NIH strategic plan, you've seen the same sort of content framework. It starts with an overview and introduction, and here the Instituter Center introduces their mission and authority, statutory authority, that is, what is it that Congress originally told us to do when they set us up or when they authorized us. And this section would also typically contain a director's message and information on the organization and founding of the Instituter Center. And the second bucket or bin is the scientific strategy, scientific goals, objectives, or priorities. And we're allowed to use any of that language, um, whatever it is we want to call the, the priorities or objectives or goals in that section. And the narratives, and this is where we set out our scientific vision and research priorities for the duration of the plan. And the narratives in this section of the template must also address, there's a planning requirement that actually comes from the Cures Act to ensure that future activities of the Institute consider women and minorities and are focused on reducing health disparities. The third bucket is um, the approach to stewardship and it's otherwise known as the stewardship strategy. And here the Institute or Center is uh, meant to outline the approach to serving as an efficient and effective steward of public resources. And it includes the management and accountability strategy with regard to these activities. And uh, this section may call, uh, cover a broad array of relevant activities, including, but not limited to, priority setting, uh, workforce diversity, scientific innovation, rigor and reproducibility, and risk, risk management. And finally, the last bucket that needs to be, the last section that needs to be addressed in the common template is the description of the strategic planning process. And here the Institute or Center describes the process that they undertook to develop the strategic plan, including how input from internal and external stakeholders was sought and incorporated. So there are actually uh, benefits to using this common template, including alignment, between IC strategic plans and the central NIH wide strategic plan. Also consistency and clarity across, I mean, from IC to IC uh, across the NIH and their strategic plans. And also reinforcement of best practices for development of strategic plans um, by requiring specific content. And I'd like to mention here that um, uh, for those of you who don't know this, there is, there is in fact an engaged community of planning officers across every IC here at NIH who meet regularly and share approaches and best practices for a variety of planning and policy responsibilities, including strategic planning. And so our efforts in designing our process benefit from the insights of this group and the experiences of this group. And we've also been able to uh, share innovative approaches that we've developed and experienced here with other, with our um, fellow, uh, our sister institutes at the NIH. So one other thing that the template does is bring cohesiveness to the presentation of individual IC goals and plans. And uh, um, note, it's noteworthy, this enables the use of NIH-wide tools for tracking plan implementation and success metrics. And I wanted to say that as part of implementation of the new plan, NIH will also be developing an, an institute-specific online tracking system. So um, this diagram will be uh, familiar, I think, to most of you. Our current plan is organized across three strategic themes, which can be loosely thought of as our fundamental research mission, that's theme one, advancing environmental health sciences, 
And our theme two is sort of our applied or translational research mission. I mean, again, loosely. Um, and then theme three, theme three is kind of our stewardship and support mission, which enables the success of the entire enterprise and promotes trust. Again, this is the diagram from our current strategic plan. And you'll see, if you think about it, that our strategic themes in our current plan translate well to the common template. Uh, if you consider that the first two themes, the advancing environmental health sciences and promoting translation, uh, put them together, they're sort of both part of the overall scientific strategy, that second bucket. Theme three then aligns with the stewardship strategy. And the other components of the uh, NIH template then will bookend these sections to open with the introduction, mission, statutory authority, and director's message, and then um, to have the document, the description of the process added at the end. So here are the starting assumptions we were making as we discussed how to approach the development of our next plan. I should note that all the process ideas here were discussed and revised and coalesced around by our full leadership team. And also we've assembled a, um, an internal planning group from across all divisions of the NIEHS to implement the planning process collaboratively. And I wanted to say my colleague, Kimberly Thigpentart here in the scope office is co-leading the plan development activity and she convenes the planning group. Many of our experienced staff in scope will be engaged in this effort over the next year and a half. So as, uh, as Rick mentioned in his um, introduction, the next strategic plan will cover the calendar 2024 to 28. Uh, we will, as I've just finished um, outlining, we will um, at least initially, uh, we will proceed with the assumption that we'll be continuing with the sort of organizational bins that are provided by the current themes. So we probably won't call them themes anymore. We may pick other terminology, but this over organizational framework that you saw in the diagram and that and that lines up with the um, NIH common template, um, we'll start out with that as kind of an organizational framework going forward. And we wanted to make sure that the plan development process um, should be aimed at assessing where the science has moved. I mean, looking at, looking at the current plan as a starting point. Where has the science moved since we were designing this plan and, and, and what has happened during the five years or the, the time that it will have been in effect? Where is the science going? Uh, we want our input to allow us to update our goals, create or revise goals to fill gaps, and adjust priorities as needed. So here is the rough outline of our timeline and process. And I would say that all of the dates here are tentative, but they show the time windows we are planning for. So for this new plan, we propose another robust input phase. So the first thing will be the publication of a request for information or solic some, a similar solicitation for requesting input on our work under the current plan with special emphasis on reviewing our existing goals and priorities and asking our stakeholders to identify continuing priorities as well as gaps and also places where the science has moved beyond the framing and understanding that we had in 2018. Our target will be to have that comment period open for 45 to 60 days if we can open it soon. 60, the 60 days if we can open it soon, 45 if, if uh, slips some more. And um, we also think it is a good time to return to holding an open space format meeting. And I should say that um, Rick was really the instigator of open space at NIH. Uh, by virtue of his having led um, the planning process for the first strategic plan under Linda's tenure, which was the first time we used open space here at NIEHS. And uh, I will say that the technology has now um, 
engaged the interest of other institutes here at the NIH. And uh, we, I continue to be a, um, a proponent and uh, spend a lot of time with my planning colleagues across NIH uh, arguing for the benefits of the open space format. The uh, open space meeting that we hope to have as part of our input phase has not yet been scheduled, but uh, we are meeting with the contractor actually this week, and I'm hoping that we can get it on the calendar and hold it sometime at least uh, no later than March of 2023, maybe a little earlier if possible, but um, that's what we're aiming for. The open space meeting right now with the pandemic in mind, rather than try to change plans in midstream, we're just, uh, we're just planning for a virtual meeting. There are some very exciting virtual formats that um, convert the open space idea to a, uh, to a virtual platform. And there are other tools that are used with them. Uh, so, and the other thing about the virtual format is that it will, it, it will accommodate more people than an in-person in format, which is like what we used before. Our tentative plan is for about 400 people, I'm hoping, um, which is more than twice what we had for the in-person meeting that was in 2011. And the other, I don't want to forget uh, other aspects of the input phase where we have access to good sources of information on research gaps, priorities and recommendations from other activities such as the workshops you've heard about and other workshops that are going on. Um, and I also wanted to say in the, the input that we get from the council discussions is very important to the overall process. And I think you will see that we've built in points in the process where council's input and review will be sought. And this actually starts with the process discussion today. Um, and I wanted to say, so it's not listed on this high level timeline, which says through spring 2023, but we would plan for the February 2023 council meeting to offer council a short update summary, summarizing input from the RFI and detailing preparations for the open space meeting. So once all the inputs have been collected, our task is to summarize and analyze the information. And that would be mean coalescing it into revised or new goals and new goals and priorities. And uh, of course, within the strategy boundaries of our template. So we anticipate this would take several months. It will be tasked to the planning committee with help from subject matter experts from across the NIEHS. And the process is actually iterative between the planning committee and the senior leadership committee. Our timeline calls for us to have draft goals based on all this input ready to circulate to council in late summer of 2023 with discussion planned for the September 2023 council meeting. So following that council meeting, we will update the draft per council discussion and then post, post the near final draft for public comment. And that, would, that public comments period would probably be for 30 days. And we would take that input and summarize it and see if we need further revision of the plan. And once senior leadership signs off, we will circulate to council one more time. And the last stage then would be finalization, layout, preparation of rollout plans, and then publication and rollout. And we will be aiming to try to make that happen as early in 2024 as we can manage. So thank you very much, and I welcome your reactions, comments, and questions. Very nice job, uh, Sheila. Uh, yes, Irva. Um, this is great. I, I'm um, impressed at the, <laughs> at the the whole outline, the timeline, and so forth. I, I think it's 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 very you know appropriate for the um, for this process. Um, and I was just uh, I, I may have missed it exactly. It did say fall, but so the RFI is it out yet? Or it's no, great. it is not. None okay. of this has happened yet. 
Okay, and then we are on the cusp. We're, we've been talking about okay. it, and but we haven't met with the contractor, which is going to be who is going to be helping us, and uh, and and so all of the a lot of stuff is like poised to happen, but um, I just wanted to share, you know, mm -hmm. the timeline and what we were hoping to do. But yes, it will it will start like very very soon. And and that first RFI comment period it will be how long? Uh. It depends on how quickly we can get it out. See, we want to organize the solicitation so that people are commenting on sort of like we did it um, for the second strategic plan under Linda. We organized the comment period so it, the comment solicitation so that it was organized by the existing goals. So it's, not, you know, we're not just putting out an RFI and saying, tell us whatever you want. We're we're trying to to bring comment streams and in, in specific things that'll enable a quicker analysis. So I have an indeterminate amount of time between now and the release because it it, it really depends on how complicated it gets when we design the, the the solicitation. If we can get it out soon, it'll be sixty days. If we can if we if it takes a little bit longer than I anticipate, it might just be forty five. Okay, so relatively short time period then for for the okay. yeah and um and and you know we'll we'll make it as long as we possibly can you know we just want to make sure that we can get the input and mm -hmm. um and and have enough time to to um do a full analysis great yeah look forward to seeing it We'll make sure to let everybody know there. I mean, we'll have a rollout plan for the RFI as well to make sure that it gets high on everyone's radar screen. Great, great. I, I feel like the, you know, the, the previous five years we've been sort of operating under, but at the same time, um, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed in the last five years. And certainly um, a lot of the urgency around climate and health has become yeah. a lot yeah. more visible and um, you know felt by everybody so um yeah I, I, and just knowing what rick the directions rick has been outlining over the last several um meetings here um and all of his work around the the, the um interagency activities as well that i i think is just phenomenal um that uh you know i i can see there's we're really at the place where uh, the instant is at the place where it's really time for an, another strategic plan. And so um, I, I'm excited to be here to be able to help it uh, develop as, as a council member. Thank well, you so much. We're excited to get your comments, Irva. So thank you. And uh, the timing is right. So let's uh, we'll and thanks to Sheila for her willingness to provide the excellent leadership for this uh, planning session as she's done in the past. Yes, uh, Dr. Goldman. Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation, Sheila, and I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the effort that you guys are going to be going through to make the strategic plan um, a really great one for the NIEHS. Uh, I'm wondering how much uh, thought um, people are giving to the role of the NIH, NIEHS, as well as you know the NIH generally, but particularly this institute, um, in um, the education of the scientific workforce. Um, in particular, I think some of the major changes that have been occurring in terms of the kind of expertise that we need to do environmental health um, science and translation um, in today's world. <laughs> And um, and I what I view as an enormous need uh, to uh, begin to um, bring together some of the many silos that exist in environmental health sciences that I, I think um, are becoming increasingly um, counterproductive. Just you know the gulfs between people, you know, in exposure science, toxicology, epidemiology, um, you know, even clinical uh, practice. Um, and you know we're talking later today about um, language, and I mean the fact is that these are disciplines all under your roof that speak different languages, and um, you know it's and you know our educational programs um, are not um, 
necessarily um, motivated uh, to uh, to be more innovative. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's really important. And and in fact, um, uh, it was something we recognized even when we did the last strategic plan. It's actually part of the first professional pipeline goal in our last strategic plan. But I think what happens is as the science moves, it becomes even more important. And the number of disciplines that are that need to be incorporated into the ability of trainees to form um, cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary groups, uh, the number of disciplines that we thought we needed to have people bring together in 2018 is even bigger now. So, um, so I think I think uh, that will certainly need to be a continuing focus. It's perfect to get that input, uh, your lend, lend your input on that next strategic plan. I think that has to be a very prominent feature of our next strategic plan because you outlined some really important issues. Well, I'd love I'd love to help, and and you know I you know I didn't even mention behavioral science because most people don't think of that as environmental science, but increasingly environmental science needs to incorporate that. Well, if you look at the exposome framework, uh, there's plenty of behavioral science uh, integrated into that. And so this is an opportunity to really be thinking very creatively and in very innovative ways to really bringing, bringing things together and to do things in a collaborative mode that we may, have done, may not have done before. So thanks for those comments, Lynn. Sheila, any other questions? Uh, no, it's just that um, I... I hope everybody will stay um, engaged even between there will be things happening. Uh, you know, the next year and a half is going to be really um, an important time frame for there are a lot of things that will be happening in between um, advisory council meetings as well. And so as we need uh, your input and thoughts, we will be reaching out and um, we'll let you know certainly um, when we know the dates of the RFI and when we know the dates of the open space meeting. Sure. Oh, yes, Trevor. Just a thought that came up as Rick was commenting, and do we know what other ICs will be doing their strategic plan in the same time frame? And if so, is there a way to actually start thinking about inter-IC uh, initiatives? So, um... <clears throat> So, uh, so there's a couple of levels on which I can answer that question. Yes, there are some other ICs that are doing strategic planning uh, in the same time frame. Um, what usually happens, and in fact, we get an opportunity to um, uh, to review, and we have reviewed and provided basically high level input uh, on every other plan that has come out since 2019. So. Um, it, it is basically a best practice for all of our institutes to circulate when, you know, either in advance of full public comment or at some other point in their process to circulate and get input from sister ICs just to see where areas of um, synergy and, and overlap could be uh, noted and taken advantage of. And we've provided input to those plans just so that they can see where you know, there might be a mention of environmental issues in the in the um, the things that they have in their plan. Um, usually, these plans are higher level than specific initiatives, so that's not um, what's being offered or shared usually at that point. But it's a recognition on the part of of our IC and the other, the partner IC, that there are areas of uh, shared interest that are then you know, uh, ripe for uh, movement by either program officials on, you know, in partnership or in other ways, um, you know, to drive things like shared um, uh, noses or whatever. So Great. it's it's an ongoing discussion. Thanks for, thanks for that. <clears throat> just, just a comment that I'll make too, uh, Trevor. Uh, you know, the, these discussions with other ICs shouldn't be happening only during the time that we're doing strategic planning. So climate change and health is an example of how we weren't do actually doing strategic planning two years ago, but reaching out, putting together the framework and how we can be working more effectively together. 
uh, that then, then can kind of roll into a strategy, the collaborative strategy uh, moving forward. So it's just uh, keeping the this whole collaborative concept and thinking in innovative new ways uh, you know, are, are elements of, of what we want to continue to look for. Great. <clears throat> Sheila, I think Phil was next. Or yes. Trevor, does that, your hand is still up. Does that answer your question? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm just learning how to put my hand down. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> While you're figuring out that, Trevor, I'll press on. Um, I, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, clearly the plan is there to, uh, to foster innovation. Uh, I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity to make the plan innovative of itself. Uh, in other words, and I'm not sure I can explain this, I don't really know how to do it, but my experience with strategic plans has been uh, there's kind of the pre-plan and then there's the post-plan. And the pre-plan is often really useful for getting people all on the same page and thinking in the same way about what it is that you, you want to do. Or if there's disagreements, you at least come to some level of a consensus to move forward. And that's great. And then potentially the thing just goes onto the shelf and collects dust. And uh, I'm not saying that has happened here or would happen here, but it's really how you can make it more of a living plan. So that the element, even though, as you say, um, Sheila, it's high level, that you can take those high level elements and you can make them really actionable on an ongoing basis. I mean, you could all, or you can actually uh you know determine that you need to drop them because something's changed which it will do over a five-year period of course but it it becomes more of a living document in some way and um you know it, and then the way i use it with an advisory group like this is uh i actually essentially put elements of the plan up uh just to actually drive the meeting that we're having um and and, and, and acts around that so I don't know, you know, it just it just seems there's an opportunity here in a changing world and in you know, so many changes you're trying to do to use a plan in a different way. So I'm really glad that you said that, because I would say that um, uh, under Rick's leadership, um, both before his directorship and and everything, we've we've actually worked very hard to make these living plans. I don't know if you recall, but um, until just recently, um, Rick used the um, the framework of the plan as basically the um, outline for uh, council agenda, and uh, you know putting things in each one of those organizational buckets. Um, the one of the things so implementation when you get to the point where you've created your plan and it's signed off and rolled out and everybody's happy and everybody's engaged because they've all been we've had the you know robust input and people went to the open space meeting and had a good time. Um, what happens then is that uh, the work of implementation typically moves into the divisions, but the divisions in our case are asked and I would say, especially that under Gwen Coleman's leadership as the previous. Uh, DERT director, our DERT direction uh, division was really, really good at um, keeping the plan in front of them while they were doing their implementation implementation work and designing initiatives and yes. seeing what the science was going to be driving. And then we were in a position to look at that. They actually kept metrics and we could look at those, you know, as time passed and we got closer to the end of the plan period just to see and it was really clear when we looked at it how much the things we said that were in the plan that were important that were priorities were reflected in the work that was done and then um, we've also just uh, updated um, coding of intramural projects to, 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 to see if we can have the same scan of our intramural project as we go forward and in fact on the intramural side when uh, when the intramural um, investigators have their reviews with their boards of scientific counselors, one of the first things they do is put up, here is the part of the strategic plan that my work is responsive to. So it really does get, we've, we've, there's been a lot, there's been good buy-in on this document basically from the previous director's administration. And I will credit uh, Rick and um, Gwen Coleman for uh, a lot of, you know, bringing people along and being able to see that it's not just a sales document. 
Yeah, so Sheila, if I could just chime in here, Phil, <clears throat> you know, I am a big fan of strategic planning and I'm a big fan of strategic planning because it truly should set the stage for the directions where work is going at the Institute. So we're not looking, and we were very specific uh, when we put together the, the, the first plan that, that Sheila and I were involved in. We didn't want a, a 300 to 400 page tome with all the details that would uh, get polished up and then put on a shelf someplace, collects dust for five years, and then you got to do it again. <laughs> so we, uh, we dust off the dust and try it over. So this should be a living document. It was short, sweet, to the point. And as, as Sheila indicated, every, for example, every intramural investigator, I don't know if Daryl wants to chime in on this, but when they present their BSC reviews, the first thing they talk about is how does the work that they do align with the strategic plan and which specific goals within the strategic plan does it align to? So our strategic plan becomes a living document. And, and I, I really have to credit Sheila working together with uh, Christy Drew and Christy Pettibone and others to develop implementation strategies, implement, implementation metrics, so that we actually know that we're, we're, we're actually tracking uh, to deliver on some of the expectations and the goals of the strategic plan. I know, Daryl, did you want to chime in? It's uh, pretty unusual that uh, intramural investigators would actually be asked to talk about how their work cross-references the, the strategic plan, but uh, I think under your leadership, they do it. Yeah, I mean, it's the BSC evaluates it. It's it's part of it's one of the major things they look at uh, when they evaluate PIs uh, and core directors as well um, and lab chiefs. And uh, yeah, everybody has a slide, a mandatory slide in their presentation and a mandatory section of their report that says here's here's how what we're doing is relevant to environmental health science strategic plan and and with reference to specific themes and goals. It's it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I also had a thought about how it influences extramural researchers. Um, I don't know if you analyze how the plan gets used extramurally, but I'm thinking as, for example, director research development, uh, I'm sure would avidly read, hopefully avidly reads the plan. And, you know, it actually then in some way influences the kind of things that we do ahead of any uh, research and uh, funding announcements. Uh, which we would anticipate coming from the plan. So it's it's kind of getting research thinking in line in a line with the institute thinking uh, earlier than when the, there's actually uh, funding opportunities. Well, I think that's a really good point. Sheila, do you want to you know, comment on this? And uh, I, I think you alluded to the fact that we we do coding. And every grant that gets funded actually codes reference uh, back to some of the goals in the strategic plan. Do you want to expand on that? Yes, um, and and yes, that <coughs> happens. But I I think that's on the back end. That's after a grant's already been awarded. And I think you're talking about what happens in the in the sort of uh, earlier stages of and and what it, what occurred to me, Phil, while you were talking was when we plan our rollout. Um, you know, we always make sure that the plan goes to the the um, listserv that governs, you know, that has all of our grantees on it. What I don't know is whether the, all of the various institutional directors of research development are part of that listserv or not. If they aren't, I guess they should be. And we need to make sure that they're part of our rollout, as well as, you know, sort of the what we think of as the usual grantee community. That would be really helpful. Yeah, and I, I can say anecdotally, we know that it does happen, um, because we get calls from from potential applicants who say you know i saw this in your strategic plan can we hum a few more bars about this <laughs> um and 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 they and they will put it in their application that this is in response to you know element whatever of of the niehs strategic plan so we know that the the community does use this as a a, a decision making tool in what to apply for uh, absolutely it does happen oh that's wonderful i find that very gratifying <laughs> Okay, Bill, does that answer your questions? It does, and I, it's great that you, you know, and just to Sheila's point, it's just fantastic you're putting so much effort into this. It's, it pays off all round, internally, externally, and, you know, for the, ultimately for the public, which is what we're supposed to be doing here. 
Well, another comment that I'll make, and, and Sheila and I talked a lot about that. I've, I've done a lot of strategic planning before in coming to NIHS, and the, the process is as an, almost important as the outcome. And the process is about engaging people in the environmental health sciences community. So what emerges shouldn't be Rick's ideas. Uh, you know, leader is, leadership is not just taking my ideas and putting it forward, but uh, trying to embrace the emerging themes, uh, the exciting concepts that are that are coming from you know the various sectors of the environmental health science and biomedical communities so that's what we try to do and uh because that's that's ultimately what a plan is going to be uh most useful for is people looking at it and so you can see what they're doing and then helping to align with you know their, their research programs to helping make bigger things happen it's a vehicle for shared governance, which I think is a great thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Karen. Think, yeah, Karen has her hand up. Yeah, Rick, to your point, um, having myself been involved in many strategic plans and then trying to implement them, like you said, you know, if you don't have buy-in, so you can have all of the greatest ideas on the planet, and if you don't have buy-in from those who are assembling it and those who will be implementing it, it, it will never go anywhere. So I think, yeah, that's great to have that broad kind of look in developing a strategic plan. Yep, and that's exactly what I mean by the process is as important as the outcome. It's- Yeah, uh, yeah for sure, think, for sure. <laughs> I think it was very reassuring. And I, I think both Sheila and I, as part of the, what, the 2011 process, it was very reassuring to go to meetings afterward and for people to come up and say, you know, that open space you had, actually was really <laughs> interesting to see that some of those breakout sessions we had actually ended up in the plan. And yeah. uh, we're pretty excited yeah. about that. And Sheila, great, great job on your presentation, but more importantly on what you're doing. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And yeah, so I'm, I'm happy you're doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just add that Sheila has been just a phenomenal partner on this, has really embraced this. And there have been many other IC directors that have asked me about this, and Sheila stepped to the plate, shared our, you know, our wisdom and our capabilities with them, and so she's become a real star in <laughs> the, the uh, planning community across the NIH. So, David, how are we doing on timing? We're okay on time. It, we, we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. If not, I propose that we extend our break by a, a whole three minutes. <laughs> Uh, and so we'll, we'll move into break now.